Hello everyone, welcome to our bandside worship today. Note that next Saturday, the 29th of October, the glass porch will be open between 10 and 11 in the morning to enable you to drop off free will offering envelopes and to contribute to the other funds of the church. Note also that our new six-part Bible study series entitled Seeing Through Luke's Eyes will begin this Wednesday, the 26th of October. Each evening, we'll uh, reflect on a passage from Luke along with a sermon related to it, as together we explore Luke's understanding of faith and life. There'll be plenty of opportunity to share what you think, and if past studies are anything to go by, also plenty of lively discussion. Meetings begin at 8 p.m. via Zoom. Information about the study and how to join it will be shared on Bandside Buzz tomorrow. If you're not signed up for Bandside Buzz, contact Amy Matson or myself for the log on details. Now, just to give you the heads up, this should be the last time we hold our Bible study by Zoom alone. In future, we hope to be able to organize what you might call hybrid meetings. And in this model, whoever wants to will be able to meet in person, while others will be able to join on Zoom if that suits them better. Now, elders are asked to pick up communion packs which are available in the main hall. And remember, the clocks go back next weekend, so take that into account in planning to come to church. Today in worship, for the times we're living through, we'll be exploring who God is how God acts, and what God wants in our lives and in our world. Describing God, the psalmist says this, God, you are big and strong. You are beautiful and full of light. You use the clouds like a chariot. You ride on the wings of the wind. You made the earth with its mountains. You spread out the seas like a velvet cloak. The trees get plenty of rain, and in them the birds build their nests. Lions roar in the darkness, rock badgers hide in the cliffs. Sea monsters play in the oceans, and ships sail on the seas. God, you have created so many things. May you be happy with what you have made. God, as for us, we will always sing songs to you. May you enjoy our worship. And the psalmist reminds us that this is what God promises. I will be with you when you're in trouble. When there are hard times, when things go wrong, I will be with you. When you make mistakes, when you feel ashamed, I will be with you. I will hear your prayers. I will stand by you. I will be with you when you are in every sort of trouble. And you know, early in his life, Paul thought that God was all about rules and regulations. But after Paul met Jesus, he came to understand that there was so much more to God than first met his fearfully legalistic eye. In wonder at the marvel of who God really is, Paul exclaims in awe, God's wisdom and knowledge and ways are so rich and deep and profound, we cannot ever get to the bottom of them. God's paths are beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Who can give God advice? Who has ever given anything to God that God needs to repay them? For all things come from God 
and are made through God and return to God. To God be the glory forever and ever. And out of all of this insight, Paul calls us deeper into worship today, saying, do not be squeezed and conformed any longer by the patterns and the ideas of this world. Instead, be transformed by the renewing of your mind and your thinking, your understanding of how things work and how we are called to live. We now continue our worship of God in the hymn, This Earth belongs to God, the world, its wealth, and all its people. And we now join our hearts and minds together in a prayer of thanks and wonder, ending with the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. Loving God of all creation, we give thanks for the wonders of your world and the friendship that you offer us in Jesus. We give thanks for the peace beyond understanding that he brings and the amazing love he shows to all sorts of people. We give thanks that He feels for us and meets our deepest needs. Amazing God, You are simply awesome. You shaped the stars, yet also thought to put a twinkle in our eyes. You carved rivers through rock and gave us tears to share along with laughter. You shattered moons into asteroids and put hearts deep within us to break for others. You ignited the spark which flung universes into space, yet also lovingly take a moment to help the likes of us. For all this wonder and mystery, we give thanks. Today, we ask that you renew and restore us through Jesus, for He alone has always been in right relations with you. And only in Him can we be in right relations with you or anyone else. So give us the grace not to try to go it alone. 
Instead, give us the grace to go along with you, following Jesus, helped by the Holy Spirit. As we do, hear us as we pray together, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trials and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Our first reading today is Exodus chapter 19, verses 1 to 9, starting on page 76 in the Pew Bibles, and it is brought to us by Arlene Allen. The Israelites have escaped from slavery in Egypt, but have not yet reached the oasis of hope and opportunity offered by the promised land. They are on the way, all right, but the wilderness lies before them. Then this happens. What do you make of what we find out about God? Over to Arlene. On the first day of the third month after the Israelites left Egypt, on that very day, they came to the desert of Sinai. After they set out from Rephidim, they entered the desert of Sinai, and Israel camped there in the desert in front of the mountain. Then Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, This is what you are to say to the descendants of Jacob and what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. So Moses went back and summoned the elders of the people, set before them all the words the Lord had commanded him to speak. The people all responded together, we will do everything the Lord has said. So Moses brought their answer back to the Lord. The Lord said to Moses, I am going to come to you in a dense cloud so that the people will hear me speaking with you and will always put their trust in you. Then Moses told the Lord, what the people had said. This is the story God has given us to think about together today. Thanks be to God. Amen. Okay, so thank you, Arlene, for that reading. Now, as you heard in the reading, God is kind of compared to an eagle. And I thought, what do I know about eagles? Indeed, what do you know about eagles? Does anybody know anything much about eagles? Does anybody know anything much about eagles? I didn't, so I had to do a bit of research. What do you know, Theo, about eagles? They are birds of prey. They are indeed. They are birds of prey. They are birds of prey. And you know, they can live up to about 40 years of age. So they really are old birds. And... And when they fall in love, they stick with the same partner, the same mate, all through life. So they're very faithful to one another. And you know, when they're getting to know one another, when they're just starting to go out with one another, do you know what they do? They fly as high, as high, as high, as high, as high as in the sky as they can, and then the, the boy and the girl, they lock their claws, their talons together. And you know what they do? They just drop like skydivers out of the deep blue sky. And they fall 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 until they can fall no further. And before they hit the ground, they just part and fly again. That's how they get to know one another and test one another out. Isn't that amazing? I'm not sure that I would want to go on a date with a girl like that. 
You'd be bungee jumping or jumping off a cliff or doing something really weird. But that's what eagles do to get to know one another. And you know, when it comes to seeing, well, eagles have great eyes. Do you know, they can, they can see in the same way as uh, a wide-angle lens works. So, you know, where we can see in front of us and a little bit to the sides if we wiggle our eyes, eagles can see far, far more around about. And their sight is about eight times more powerful than human sight. And they don't even have to wear glasses like you and me, Theo. They can see like that. And guess how far they can see a rabbit from. I mean, if a rabbit was to hip hop in there just now, I could hardly see it. Certainly not if I had my glasses off. But an eagle can see a rabbit from 300 meters. So their eyesight is pretty amazing. And when it comes to living and where they live, they, of course, live in, le in nests. Do you know how big an eagle's nest can be? It can be kind of between two to three meters. So what's that? Somewhere between six foot and ten foot, something like that. Let's look at what that is really like. So that's how wide it is. I don't think that, I, Theo, do you want to come up and hold the end of this till we get to, till we get to, well, there's there's kind of one meter, so that's pretty big. And we're up now to two meters. So that's kind of the smallest that an eagle's nest would be. And if we go, you're going to have to move or I'm going to drop off the end of the world here. Theo, uh, let's see. Ooh, the, yeah, there's three meters. That's huge across. And it's the same height as well. It is huge. Heavens above, Theo, I could live in a nest like that. But I'm not finished yet. Theo, come stand by me. We're going to have to do a wee bit more. We're all right. Good man. But they're really caring as well. Because in that huge nest where they are so happy to snuggle down and sleep, when a time comes for, for eggs, they create a tiny, tiny, tiny little safe place right at the bottom of the nest for the eggs to sit in and for the, the chicks to be born in. So they are amazing and amazingly caring, which you wouldn't think of for an eagle, would you? Because they are, like you told us, Theo, birds of prey which means that they kind of swoop down and grab things like rabbits and all of that, don't they? So, eagle's wings. That's what we're talking about in our reading today. Eagle's wings. How broad are an eagle's wings? Well, they can be up to two meters. So that is, let's see, where are we here? Wow. Wow. two meters of eagle's wings. Isn't that amazing? Two meters of eagle's wings. Wow, that's us now, Theo. Good man, thank you for your help. And they are strong. They are strong. Do you know that a, an eagle's grip is about 10 times as strong as a human grip? So, you know, when we think about God being like an eagle, as in our reading today, think about it like this. God is faithful to us, and God wants us to be faithful to God as well, particularly following Jesus and doing the sorts of things that Jesus does, helping people out, being kind, being merciful, being compassionate. So God is faithful and wants us to be 
faithful. And part of that is that God wants us to have sharp eyesight, just like God has. Because God saw in our story that the Israelites were in trouble and were having a hard time, and God said, I'm going to have to go and help those people. And God wants us to have sharp eyes as well, and to look around us and see who is in trouble and find them too. So God is faithful and wants us to be faithful. God is sharp-sighted and wants us to be sharp-sighted too, to see who we need to help. And God is strong. And God wants us to be strong as well, helping others and doing good and following Jesus. So remember those things and remember about the eagle. And, well, I kind of hope that you don't run into one going home unless it's way, way up in the sky and playing with its mate for life. And our hymn together now is, We Are Marching in the Light of God. And after that, children and young people can leave for their time and activities together. So, we are marching in the light of God, just like the Israelites were all of those years ago. With all that is happening in politics, in the lives of ordinary people, and in the wider world, we turn to God in a prayer for peace, for ourselves, and for our world. Let us pray. Lord God, who confronts chaos and creates shalom, peace, every variety and level and strand of peace. Today we pray for all robbed of peace at heart by what they are living through. We ask for peace at heart to help people in need overcome their fears, anxieties, and troubled minds. Lord, bring solace, comfort, peace at heart. Today we pray for peace at home 
when so many families are under so much pressure and strain from so many different directions. Lord, bring wisdom, support, peace at home. Today we pray for peace in the virtual online world where all people, but especially young people, can have their sense of worth crushed by cruelty, even to the point of contemplating suicide. Encourage young and old to dream the right dreams, to live creatively, to relate with kindness, to have real adventures free from violence and aggression. Lord, bring peace in the virtual online world. Today we pray for peace with the earth we all depend on. Encourage us to care for forests, to commit to protecting the environment, to support fair trade, to recycle, to make compost, to do what needs to be done. Lord, bring peace with the earth. Today we pray for peace in the marketplace, in commerce and economic relations. Help us to live humbly and responsibly, to share generously, to stand up for the rights of the poor and exploited. Lord, bring peace in the marketplace, in commerce and economic relations. Today, we pray for a form of peace in the world that is qualitatively more than the absence of war and violence. Help us to learn nonviolence, to step back from provocation, to resolve conflict, to stop the growth of the arms trade, to lobby governments, challenge apathy, think deeply and act wisely. Lord, help us to seek peace your type of peaceful shalom and to pursue it all around this chaotic world. And today we pray for ourselves that we will live with hope, strive for change, and act with humility, courage, and faith. Lord, challenge us to choose peace with justice and reconciliation with love. In Jesus' name we pray, and for his sake, amen. The hymn, God of grace, amazing wonder, irresistible and free. <clears throat> Thank you. 
our second reading today is Philippians chapter 3, starting at the the second part of verse 4 and reading down to verse 11. Those verses are found on page 1180 in the Pew Bibles. Listen to how Paul powerfully tells us that his relationship to Christ Jesus has become the most important aspect of his life, and how he tells us that he is willing to give up absolutely everything for that relationship. Paul writes saying, if anyone thinks they have reasons to put confidence in human things, in the flesh, I have more, circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for legalistic righteousness, faultless. But whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss, for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider those things rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. I want to know Christ and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in His sufferings, becoming like Him in His death, so that somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead, May God strengthen and challenge us through the reading of this passage today. Amen. Let us pray. God of the eagle's wings that carry us to freedom, God of the reluctant travelers who will not always accept such special help, God of the stubborn hearts, which too often resist your call and your purposes. Speak to us wherever we are on our journey, and by the wind of the Spirit at our back, help us to follow in the footsteps of Jesus. In His name we pray, and for His sake. Amen. Israel was on a roller coaster of a journey that was even more extreme than the one Britain has been on in recent days, weeks, and indeed years. And that has been jaw-dropping enough. Israel has come through the mighty waters of Exodus, and the wasteland lies ahead. A wilderness experience looms we may well be in for one of those too. But before taking the first steps on that dangerous and uncertain path into the unknown, in a little gem of a story, our Old Testament reading gives us a glimpse of who God is, how God acts, and what God wants, then and now. This story tells Israel what it means for God to be at work in Israel's life together, in the process, in a well-balanced way. It says something about good news, that is, the gospel, as well as the need for us to respond, that is, discipleship. On the one hand, it says something about the amazing deeds of God as well as on the other, what is required of us. Focusing on God, it affirms, you have seen 
what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. God entered a dire situation with a positive impact that a modern-day politician could only dream of. God saved, really saved, a community that was being crushed. Life was completely transformed and turned towards hope. And then, focusing on what is required of people on the the receiving end of this intervention, God says, Now, therefore, if you will obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my own possession among all the peoples. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. This is a moment when faith is kindled and then ignited. It's when the penny drops and the light goes on, illuminating the purpose of God's activity. It's an early variation of the central affirmation of biblical truth, which is that God's coming changes lives in deep, radical, decisive ways. Centuries later, Peter also perfectly captures what it's all about when he reminds a beleaguered little bunch of early Christians, once you were no people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. In effect, he is saying, once you were nothing, now you are something. Once you were unloved, now you are loved. The deep, deep truth is that God engages with us, with all of us, whether we are completely aware of that or not. And God is for us, whether we are aware of that or not. God saves us, not because of anything that we have done, but because God is a saving God. Let's call this, when we realize what's going on, the saving moment. It's when, to borrow the imagery of our reading, it dawns on us that God comes to bear us on eagle wings. It's when the old ways, the old thinking, the old ideas, the old powers that have shaped us for so long begin to lose their grip and cannot permanently hold on to us anymore. And the thing is, this saving moment comes in our personal lives. I hope you know and believe the truth of that, but also in the unfolding drama of history. Think of the Exodus event. It's when all the might of Pharaoh, all of his economic policy built on brutality and exploitation and the backs of the poor, all of his military prowess and firepower cannot resist the powerful coming of God to bring freedom, transformation, salvation. Think also of God coming in Jesus Christ. All the Jewish religious leaders, with their harsh and misguided interpretation of the law, and all of the fearsome strength of the Roman colonial regime, with its legions and spies and collaborators, cannot thwart this poignant but powerful saving moment, even when together they conspire to connive at the execution of Jesus with all the cruelty and humiliation they can muster, 
as a warning to others. But you know, even as we celebrate the saving moment, we need to remember and acknowledge that in both our personal lives and in wider society, the distorting, limiting, damaging powers that God wants to save us from still exist and are still active. So, even as, like the Israelites in our reading, we say, we will do everything the Lord has asked, we know it won't happen exactly like that. It didn't back then, and it won't now. You know how it goes. We get pulled back into old ruts. We persist with old patterns and proclivities. We continue to go wrong, even as we genuinely try to model God's standards and grow more like Jesus. For many of us, perhaps the journey to become the people we want to be, or more importantly, the people God wants us to be, is one of two steps forward, one step back. Sometimes, though, along the way, even on a journey like this, we can encounter saving moments which are also painful and challenging and disruptive. Consider this. At times, to save us, God tears us away from what we crave and cherish and think we can't live without. To borrow the imagery of our reading again, God comes like an eagle, yes, but God comes like an eagle swooping down with sharp claws to rip us away from what we want to hold on to. It was that way for Israel, for when God got them out into the desert, they cried out, were there not enough graves in Egypt that you had to bring us into this desolation to die, O oh God? They couldn't tear themselves away from the nostalgic idea that although they were slaves in Egypt, at least they had the flesh pots the markets allowed them. And in His way, Jesus came as something of a sharp, clawed, saving eagle to rip folk away from what they thought was integral to their existence. You'll remember how to the entitled rich young ruler, he said, yes, you can be saved, but first divest yourself of your stocks and shares and all your wealth. To the greedy man who had a plan for, to borrow a phrase, growth, 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 but no sense of taking care of poor people like Lazarus, Jesus said, you fool, you've missed the point. Tonight, you will die. To the strong who didn't take their responsibility to the needs of children seriously, he said, better for you to have a heavy millstone hung around your neck and you tossed into the depths of the sea. To the Pharisees, he said, you are nothing but whitewashed tombs. You rabbit on and on and on about religion, but you pay no attention to what really matters to God. Justice, mercy, faithfulness. And to a committed, professional, determined hunter down of Christians, the resurrected Lord Jesus says, Saul, Saul, why are you 
persecuting me. And the thing is, Saul listens, becomes Paul, and a standout example that embracing a new way is possible. He views his top drawer religious status as worthless. He tears up his prestigious CV. He radically expands his understanding of how God is involved in the world to love and to save. He gives up everything that has anchored and shaped and given meaning to his life in order to know more and more and more of the surpassing greatness of this Christ Jesus, who has sought him out and come to him. Now, instead of inflicting suffering, he is in solidarity prepared to suffer, to help others, just like Jesus. Let me leave you today with a thought and a question, a question woven of several dimensions. First, the thought. When God comes as an eagle in a saving moment, even if sometimes such a moment may be disruptive, challenging, and painful. Ultimately, God intends our growth and our health, our development and our good through the experience. Greater obedience to the true ways of God, becoming more like the generous people God wants us to be, taking our neighbors with new seriousness and justice and love, showing compassion and wiping the tear from every eye. These are the things that God wants. Now the question, you know, given all the issues and anxieties, crises and hardships we are facing into, what do you need to give up to make those good things of God happen? What do you think others need to give up? Who might those others be? What do we need to give up as a society? What about as a global community? Seriously. Come back with your thoughts next week. Or we may not have much of a sermon. Amen. And now we pause and come to God in a prayer for change. Let us pray. God, I asked for strength but you gave me difficulties to tackle. I asked for wisdom, but you gave me problems to solve. I asked for easy prosperity, but you gave me ways to earn enough. God, I asked for courage, but you gave me fears to overcome. I asked for love, but you gave me troubled folk to help. I asked for special treatment, but you gave me opportunities to bear witness at cost to myself. God, I received nothing I wanted, but I received everything I needed. Lord, help us to change how we understand so much and so become your people able to play our part in the extraordinarily challenging, exceptionally anxious times we are living through. Times which show no sign of ending any time soon. Our prayer we bring 
in the name of the Jesus we need to be with us in everything. Amen. Our closing hymn today is Behold the Lord upon His throne, during which the offering will be brought forward. As disciples of Jesus, we live in testing times. So let me leave you with a poem that speaks about a, a particular model of discipleship. I find it deeply helpful and hope you will too. It's by Maya Angelou and it says, when I say I am a Christian, I'm not shouting I am saved. I'm whispering I get lost. That is why I chose this way. When I say I am a Christian, I don't speak of this with pride. I'm confessing that I stumble and need someone to be my guide. When I say I am a Christian, I'm not trying to be strong. I'm professing that I am weak and pray for strength to carry on. When I say I am a Christian, I'm not bragging of success. I'm admitting I have failed and cannot ever pay the debt. When I say I am a Christian, I'm not claiming to be perfect. My flaws are too visible, but God believes I'm worth it. When I say I am a Christian, I still feel the sting of pain. I have my share of heartaches, which is why I seek His name. When I say I am a Christian, I do not wish to judge. I have no authority. I only know that I am loved. Caring God, take us and this our offering to bring change for good and as a sign that we will do everything you require of us. And now may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the one who is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, support and encourage us at this time and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>